but he wrote 3,000 of them. So where in the world are the rest of them? Um, you may not know this, but I'm going to give you something that's a fact. Okay. All problems come from one place. You think they come from China. <laughs> no. Believe it or not, they come from Africa. Most all problems. See, Africa existed long before China existed. And, and, and if you know anything about the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of Sheba was from what we call modern day Yemen, which is at the southeastern or south portion of the Arabian Peninsula, which borders Africa. And when the Queen of Sheba came and heard Solomon, don't think for a moment she didn't bring a pen and paper. Don't think for a moment she didn't bring an entourage of people, uh, not just bearing gifts to Solomon, but trying to figure out how this guy is so wise. And she took many of these 3,000 proverbs with her back to Yemen. It wouldn't have been Yemen back then, but uh, you know, don't think for a moment that this uh, queen just walked away from her meeting with Solomon without gleaning a ton of information from him. Think again. The Bible says in 1 Kings 10, 4 through 7, it says, when the queen of Sheba saw all that Solomon's wisdom did and the house that he built and the meat of his table or the food that he was able to provide all the servants and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel and, their cup, and his cupbearers and the accent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. She came in with this reservation. She's heard from all over the world, corners of the world, that this guy Solomon is there is no equal to him. So she had to go find out for herself. So she traveled all the way from Yemen, if you would, to Israel just to see it. And after she saw it and talked to the guy, there was no more spirit left there. She said, this guy is beyond anything I was told. Says uh, she was mesmerized, if you would, by his wisdom. And no doubt took notes and brought back home to her own people, which of course, Yemen borders Africa. No wonder Africa is the land of Proverbs. It says in 1 Kings 10, 6 and 7, and she said to the king, it was a true report that I heard in my own land of thy acts and thy wisdom. How be it, she said, I believe not the words until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. <laughs> thy wisdom and prosperity exceeded the thing which I heard. So Solomon, no doubt, is responsible for all the Proverbs in Africa because he's the one that passed all this down to everybody else, including the Queen of Sheba, which lived in Yemen and bordered the continent of Africa. So uh, let me give you one of these African Proverbs, okay? It's, it's still a proverb to this day. It comes from Africa. When a mighty tree falls, the birds are scattered into the bush. By the way, does that sound like familiar scripture? <laughs> Listen to Zechariah 13, 7. By the way, what that means is when good leadership dies, the people like sheep scatter for cover. And is that not true? You know, Alexander the Great, the whole reason he won control of the entire world is because he told his men at Issus, that's where he faced the uh, Medo-Persian king. The Medo-Persian king had 200,000 soldiers. He had 20. It's 10 to 1 against Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great said to his men, said, we're only going for one guy here. I don't care how many men we lose, we're going for one guy. We're going for the leader. We're going for Darius. We get him, we cut the head off the snake, and everybody will scatter. It was even a problem in, in Alexander's day. Listen to Zechariah 13, 7, because these African proverbs really do come from Scripture. Awake, O sword, Zechariah says, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow. Of course, this was quoted in the New Testament concerning Christ. Say the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be what? Scattered. See, this African proverb parallels to Scripture. Because all Proverbs have to have a wisdom to them that is beyond their wisdom. Here's another 
happens in Proverbs. No matter how long, a, <laughs> this one's funny. No matter how long a log stays in the water, it does not become a crocodile. I mean, that's a simple proverb, but it has great meaning to it. It means you will always be who you are, regardless of how long you fake your character. Ooh. Uh, by the way, doesn't that sound like something that comes from Scripture? It does. Listen to Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to evil? No, your character says you ain't going to do good. You are never going to be accustomed to doing good because you've not done good. You are who you are. You can't fake that. You see, these African proverbs no doubt originally came from Solomon and most likely his visit with the Queen of Sheba who took that most of these proverbs like everybody else and, and of course they border Africa and they all went into Africa. You say, well, what are you getting at? Well, here's the point of the entire message tonight. No matter who wrote these proverbs, we know who wrote the Proverbs in the Bible, but no matter who wrote all of these Proverbs, a proverb, be it inspirational or just informational, now listen, is always defined as a short sentence based on long experience. Did you catch that? A proverb, no matter if it comes from the Bible or Solomon's other 3,000 Proverbs or man's Proverbs, they always come from long experience. Meaning you just don't come up with these sayings. Somebody with long experience is behind all Proverbs. That's a given. Be it inspirational or just informational, a proverb is always a short sentence based on long experience. So don't think for a moment that the 3,000 proverbs that Solomon wrote came from him, because they didn't. We know, according to Scripture, all this wisdom came from God. Wasn't well, God called the ancient one? The one with all the long experience? Yes or no? Okay, now this, this is going to bring this to a head here tonight. Say, well, where did that come from? All proverbs come from someone who has long experience. Solomon was only in his 20s when he wrote 3,000 proverbs. He didn't have the experience to write all this stuff. It had to come from somewhere else. Because that's what a proverb is. It's based on something that took long experience to figure out. Solomon had help, and his help came from the ancient one. You say, is that the message? No, but we're getting to it. Daniel 7, 9, I'm going to build this thing up here for you. Daniel said, I beheld till the thrones were cast down in the ancient of days. Talking about God the Father, the one with long experience, did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair is head like pure wool, and his throne was like fiery flame and wheels of burning fire. Meaning you and I need to literally heed to the Proverbs of God. Why? Because they come from someone with long experience, ancient experience. Been there, done that experience. This is why we're going to take a fresh look at the book of Proverbs. Because a lot of times we like to study Proverbs, but we don't necessarily follow its instruction. We like to say, well, I read from Proverbs every day, 31 chapters, 31 days in a month, I like to read a chapter a day, and that's great, but what good is it if you don't apply it, if you don't heed to it? Which brings me to the unbelievable wisdom behind the following proverb. <laughs> By the way, every proverb in Proverbs is worth digesting to the fullest, but I'm only going to give you one proverb tonight that is worth its weight in gold. Remember, this is just one, one out of 3,000, or in the book of Proverbs case, one out of 300, I don't know how many wisdom statements are in Proverbs, I'll look that up someday. Proverbs 16, 18. 
Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. <laughs> On my way here tonight, I was coming by Parkins. Everybody knows Parkins. And uh, boy, you can smell the food from a mile away. And as I was coming, you know, the, the, the speed limit changes there. You're, you're going, you're coming into Hunt County, you're leaving Rockwell County, I guess, and so it goes from 70 to 75, which all of us love. That way we can do 80, you know. Well, this, this Ultima, Silver Ultima, I can see my rear view mirror, man, he's just flying. Of course, there's a lot of traffic, trucks. We're trying to wait our turn, finally hit the 75 mile hour mark, and, and, and the cars got all smashed upside and everything else. And I'm thinking, man, I don't want to get in this guy's way. So I slowed down, even though I was getting close to the truck to pass him, I slowed down so he could get from me. And man, he just whew, went right from me. I got off his tail. I could have stayed on his tail. I waited a long time to get where I was going. Everybody understand that? I just got off. So it takes us a little while once we get into Hunt County and we get past all these vehicles. And uh, another vehicle, we come up to another truck, and so we all have to slow down, and I'm staying away from this Ultima, and uh, this other car wants to get in, so I slow down. Well, he moves up close to the truck and just kind of sneaks in front of the silver Ultima. I'm thinking, man, I don't know if you want to get in front of him. You don't know this. But this guy's in a hurry. And boy, I'm telling you, that guy in the Ultima was ticked. So I really stayed off, because I know there's an accident coming. And he sat, and we're doing 75 feet miles an hour, trying to. And he sat on that, it was a black Mercedes convertible, sat on that guy or that girl's tail until I got past the truck, and the, and the person in the Mercedes finally pulled over. This guy pulled over and just, how dare you get in front of me? I mean, that was, and sat on this Mercedes guy's tail. So I'm thinking, man, I'm this guy in this Mercedes, or gal, whoever it is. Uh, I'm getting off at the next exit, and hopefully this guy moves on. <laughs> and this person gets off, and that, that thing follows him. Now, you, you say, what's the problem here? You got mad? The guy got mad? You got a problem? And the only thing that can come from that, according to the wisdom of Scripture, is destruction. I don't know if you know this, Peg was there, so she can verify this. When our kids were little, we were coming home from a Wednesday night, and my wife said, hey, you know that French fry place? We were young, so we could eat French fries. The big, thick cut French fries. Yeah, how about, you know, the kids were there. How about, I said, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and do that. So we had to go over this bridge, and when we did, th this guy was behind me just, his lights, and I thought it was a wisdom purse. And, and, and so I actually, you know, moved over and, and, and moved into a gas station because I just, I didn't know what, and this guy came in right there and he says, he got out of, out of his car and he says, you, you cut me off, you did it, and I had no idea where he cut me. He must have been somebody else because it wasn't me. I got a wife and kids in my back seat. And so uh, he went back to the car and he opened the door and he's fighting for something. And somebody in the front seat's trying to keep him from getting it. So my wife says, she probably got the gun. And I said, well, I'm going to find out. She says, you idiot, you don't need to find out. Well, I was young. So I opened the car door, and I, I go up to the car, and I said, man, what is your problem? And he's still fighting for whatever he's trying to get to. And the lady inside the car said, mister, you need to go now. He plans to shoot you. thought over something that I didn't even do? See, but that was pride on my part to get out of the car. I was headed for destruction, folks. You say, what are you still doing here? I got it. That's all I can say. Well, not only that, I did have a little wisdom. As soon as she said, he's going to shoot you, I thought, hmm, I better go. <laughs> I turned around, got back in the car, and my wife said, why, why are you so white as a sheep? Uh, somebody yelled at me and said he was going to shoot me. She said, let's go, let's get out of here. And uh, we ended up going. Um, 
Most folks know this proverb by heart. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. What they don't know is the ancient wisdom behind this proverb. And this is why we need to take a fresh look at Proverbs. We, we, we need to look at it closer than we've ever looked at Proverbs before. God just didn't give these Proverbs to Solomon to write down because he had nothing better to do. No, this proverb, like all Proverbs, comes from having long experience, longer than our 6,000 years of human existence. So everything you read in Scripture in the Proverbs comes from long experience. And we need to heed to these things because it comes from long experience, longer than the 6,000 years we've been on earth. Listen to Job 38. 1 through 7. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? By the way, Job's problem was his, he, he lost track of the love of God. He thought God was being mean to him. I didn't do nothing wrong. By the way, Job did nothing wrong. He was right about that. But he was wrong about accusing God of not loving him. So <laughs> God has this conversation with Job and says, you think you know it all? Are you in control of everything? Or am I in control of everything, including your life, including allowing Satan to come into your life and to bump you? Am I in control? If I'm in control of that, I have all this wisdom. You're still in Satan's hands. Don't doubt my love. Who is this, verse 2, that darkened counsel by words without knowledge? God says to Job. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer thou me. <laughs> Where were you? He says to Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth. By the way, what he's saying is, were you here when I created this earth? Were you here? You, you weren't even thought of. Outside of me, knowing you were going to be born, you weren't even thought of when I created this earth. Declare, he says to Job, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath attached the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? How come this thing just sits out here like a sphere in the middle of the universe? Well, the Milky Way here, part of the universe. Uh, answer that. How does, it, how does it just hang there? Answer, Joe. You, you have all the answers. <laughs> now watch this, verse 7. It says, when the morning stars, talking about the angels, folks, which includes Satan before his fall, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, he said, you weren't there when I created this special planet called Earth. My first creation was there, which included Lucifer before he turned into Satan, before his fall. See, how do you know it was before his fall? because it was here on earth when he did fall. We'll get to that in just a moment. Long before man was ever placed on this earth, the angels, which includes Lucifer before his fall, rejoiced over earth's creation. Now, by the way, they didn't know why they were rejoicing over earth's creation. God said, I made a special place. They had no idea the plans behind this special place called earth. They had no idea. And the Bible says that the angels would often visit this planet Long before we were here, long before there was a sun in the, in the sky. I don't know if you know that. There was no sun in the sky when God created the earth. There was no moon. None of that happened until we were created. We're the ones that needed the moon and the sun as signs. But there was none of that, and yet there was light. Why? Because God is light. You, you do realize there's not going to be a sun in the, or in the uh, uh, eternity to come. The Bible says the land will be the light of it. There'll be no sun, no moon. Won't need those symbols anymore. He said, ah, that doesn't compute. That's because all we've known in our short lifetime is what we've experienced. But listen to the ancient one. All these angels knew that this earth was special, and then it happened. You say, what happened? Well, Ezekiel explains what happened. Ezekiel 28, verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Now, this isn't literally king of Tyrus, because the king of Tyrus has never been in the Garden of Eden. 
The king of tyrants here is symbolic of Satan. We know that according to the context. Thus saith the Lord unto the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. No more magnificent angel has ever been created than Lucifer. By the way, Lucifer, it sounds like an evil name because of what we've been told, but in reality, it means son of the morning. It's one of the most beautiful names you could have ever been given. Now, nobody would name their child Lucifer, <laughs> okay, because its connotation is it's, it's parallel to Satan, which is true. But the first name given to him was a beautiful name, Lucifer, son of the morning. You are the brightest. He, 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 would be, he, he, he would be the North Star of today. He said, wait a minute, there's, there's a star brighter than the North Star, and it moves. North Star is fixed. Well, what you're talking about is Jupiter. It's a planet, not a star. Yes, it is brighter than the, <laughs> the North Star, you know, but it's a planet. So in that reason, it moves, whereas the North Star doesn't, it's fixed. Here's the point. This angel, greater than Michael, Gabriel, and all the other angels put this, how do you know that he's greater than all? Because read the book of Jude. When contending with the devil over Moses' body, remember when Moses died and they buried him in the mountain, and the devil said, listen, we need this, all these people are people worshipers. They're going to worship this man Moses that brought him out. So we need to let them know where he's buried so they can make a shrine for him and, and you know, do all these wonderful things. And, and that's not who we're supposed to worship. So God sent down Michael and Gabriel and some other angels to tell Satan, you cannot let the people know where I buried Moses. They said, yeah, but you're, you're talking to Lucifer. Lucifer is a hundred times greater than any of us, and we're our angels. Lucifer was the most is the most magnificent creature. That's why he'll mess with it. Even these other angels don't mess with Satan. So I'd be careful about how you talk to Satan. Oh yes, greater is he that is in you, the Holy Spirit, than he that is in the world. And I would be careful how you address this greatest creature. Someday you'll be greater than him, but not now. Say, why will I be greater than him when you get your new resurrected body? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, that the, the angels will minister unto us, and if Satan was a part of that group still, which he will be, he would minister to us. Someday we're going to be greater than the angels, but not yet. Listen to what it says. Verse 13. It says to the king of Tyrus, which is really an name for Lucifer, Satan, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. See, he'd been on earth before. The sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, and thy pipes was prepared in the day that thou was created. Meaning he was the most magnificent creature God ever created. And you and I can't compare to him. Or any of the other angels. Or any of the other creations. That God has ever created. Verse 14. Thou art the anointed chair. The anointed means the leading chair. The one greater than all other angels was Lucifer. And I have set thee so, God said. I made you this way. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Talking about Sinai. This is long before we ever were created. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fires. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. This is where Satan fell. He fell on earth trying to discover why earth was so special to God. God's not telling me why. He's not telling any of us why. And I'm, I know how great I am. Is that pride? Hmm. So the fall of Satan is pride, yes? Hmm. So no wonder God gives us these problems. Because long before, maybe millions, billions of years before we ever got here, who knows? <laughs> Satan fell from pride, and so God gave that wisdom to Solomon and said, Listen, <laughs> because I have long experience, you want to stay away from pride. Long before we were ever created on this special planet called Earth, Lucifer was visiting it. 
and this is when he fell. And by the way, how did he fall? Pride. Is that, is that described anywhere? Yes. Isaiah chapter 14. Look at verse 12. I'm coming to a point here. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt, what's those next two words? My throne. You don't realize this, but, but Satan was given a kingdom long before we were here. We're the ones that were the kings of everything until Adam turned over our governorship of the world to Satan. He had his own kingdom long before we were ever created. This guy was something. The Bible says, For thou hast said in my heart, verse 13, I will ascend into heaven. I am so greatly created. I'm going to take over my creator. You say, that, that doesn't happen with the creatures of God. Oh, have you not been to any of the universities here in America today? Who mock the, you know, that there is even a God? And laugh at the scriptures? There's nothing new under the sun. He said, for thou set in my heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, all the other angels. I will sit, and by the way, he was so magnificently created that he convinced a third of all the angels to follow him. Only 66% of the angels that have been created are still following God. A third of them are following him, and uh, those are your demons. And by the way, the Bible says that angels are myriad de myriad, that's the Greek, meaning they're without number. We, on the other hand, there's only been about 15 billion people on planet Earth. There's about 8 billion right now. But since man started in the garden 6,000 years ago, uh, 7 billion have come and gone, according to statistics, uh, statisticians. And there's about 8 billion there. So about 15 billion altogether. Uh, compare our 8 billion human beings with an innumerable amount, one third of an innumerable amount of angels. There's a lot of demons there on Earth. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Satan said, or Lucifer said, he became Satan. And yet God says, you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So you say, we do know what did in Satan. Yeah, probably. Probably. Yet how many of us actually look at this verse? And say, you know what? This thing comes from long experience. No, no wonder he gave it to Solomon to give to us. And we just kind of brush past it and say, well, that's what that's saying. And yeah, it's probably true, but, you know, does it really apply to me? Uh, yeah. If you only knew how much it applies to us. Pride is the number one killer. I was telling the folks this last Sunday. I said, uh, you know, there are certain people that bring the best out of you spiritually. It's like, hopefully there's people of you. But, but the best someone can bring out in any of us, spiritually speaking, is humility. If we walk away from being with another believer, humble, they brought the best out of you. Bible says in Proverbs 6, these six things of the Lord hate yet, and a seven are an abomination unto him. First thing that's mentioned, a proud look. God hates pride. But see, whether he spells that out for us or not, he's given us this proverb that comes from long experience because he saw what happened to Satan when he fell because of pride and the destruction that he's, he's facing for all eternity future and begs us to take a fresh look at all the Proverbs that come from long experience. Not just this one verse in Proverbs 16. All the Proverbs. And to heed them. So how in the world do I keep from being proud? Well, the Bible says there's nine different ways to practice humility. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's in Scripture. Well, I didn't know that. How come you know that? 
Because a long time ago, I decided I did not want to be proud, and I'm going to find out how not to be proud. You say, give me one of the ways to be humble. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. My people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Prayer. If you don't have a prayer life, I'm not picking on you, but if you don't have a prayer life, you're not practicing humility. So oh, it's no big deal. Long as I'm saved and I'll get to heaven. Yeah, you will. But you have a greater chance of becoming proud somewhere along the line than those who pray. You say, is there other, there's nine different ways. And by the way, one of the nine ways is mentioned more often than the other eight ways put together. So that's the one you really want to focus on. You know, which one is that? Do you want to know the other six or eight? Yeah, give them all to me. Well, I'll give you one more. Fasting. Yeah, how many Christians fast? I'm not picking on Christians. By the way, God only asks us to fast for a 24 hour period. So why don't people in the Bible that like fasted 40 days? Yeah, Moses fasted. Jesus fasted 40 days. Some people fast three days. I have fasted as long as seven days. And that's a killer. But fasting isn't so you and I can get something bad. The only reason for fasting is to humble yourself. Deny the visible so you can get a hold of the invisible. It's the only reason for it. For humility's sake. So if you say, well, now I know, I might lose a few pounds. <laughs> Do what you want. But the whole reason behind fasting is for humility purposes. Is humility that important? God said, I put it in a proverb. <laughs> it comes from ancient wisdom. It, it comes from long experience, longer than you've been here. So take a fresh look, if you would, at all the problems. And start to reconsider what you're reading and, and start applying these things because it comes from long experience. Okay. Here's uh, something our daughter gave us. Hopefully your daughter could have given you this someday, but our daughter gave us this. Gave my wife this. She gave her a plaque this year with a proverb on it. Here's the proverb. By the time a woman realizes her mother was right, she has a daughter who thinks she's wrong. It's it a it, it's, it's true. They don't realize we're right, even though we've got more long experience than they do as kids, but they don't realize we're right until they become adults. And then they slap their heads and say, what was I thinking? I think we've all been there, done that. But see, you don't have to be there to do that if you would just go to the Proverbs now. Take a fresh look at all the Proverbs and start studying each one and digging as deep into them as you can because there's long experience behind each and every Proverb that God has given us. I just gave you one tonight. Father, help us to take a fresh look at the book of